Yeah. Uh, good evening. Uh, this is uh, Soumya Choudhury. Uh, I'm a professor at IFM Business School. I wanted to actually talk to you about data science. So uh, I think the slides are up, and you can probably see, uh, you know, the the topic for the today. And uh, so let's get started. What I want to do in this is basically cover some of these topics, which is you know giving you an overview of data science. Big data, the lot of terminologies that are used, uh, essentially meaning the same thing. Uh, what is the kind of types of data, the kind of volumes uh, to in today's context, uh, the type of analytics that can be done on such data, and then we want to actually look at you know where is this applied. So what are the kind of industry use cases and industry applications, and then I want to probably give you a brief of. Um, the program itself. So maybe half an hour we can cover the main topics and then uh, spend around 10 minutes on um, IFM's uh, PGDM and data science program and then open this up for questions. So let's dive right in. Okay. So if you look at wherever data is being collected as big data or in bulk, you take uh, diagnostic imaging, you know, lots of data um, being collected there for, um, you know, uh, things like x-rays and, um, you know, MRIs and so on. Uh, genome sequencing, even, uh, you know, things like trials for drugs, you have lots of data collected and all this falls in the realm of big data. If you look at some of the social media apps and um, some of the use cases there, a lot of photos and videos are shot every day. <clears throat> they are mostly shared on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and so on. These also would really constitute big data once they're used for analytics. If you look at smart cities, smart buildings, any specific locations where there is ongoing video surveillance, this is very bulky data, which is again collected, and um, this would also be a use case as big data. Um, sensor information uh, from uh, electric grids, what is called smart grids. Um, these keep feeding data, you know, pretty much every minute there is, uh, you know, syncing of data. And, uh, you know, typically the data runs into terabytes and even, you know, sometimes petabytes. Uh, like if you look at the Large Hadron Collider uh, in CERN in Switzerland, which is kind of trying to detect, uh, you know, the hidden uh, alpha particles. Uh, it's probably streaming 15 petabytes of data a year. So here we're really talking of big numbers. We'll come to the scales uh, in, a, in a slide or two, but just, just bear with me for a minute. And finally, if you look at even some of the geotagging and the RFIDs and GPS, lat long navigational data, which is streaming for all uh, digital supply chains, pretty much a lot of those uh, fall in the realm of big data. So I would say these are five use cases which would give you a gamut of you know, the fact that it covers pretty much every industry. Moving forward, um, what is the real types of data? So we know there is something called structured data and something called unstructured data. But I mean, if you were to really go at it one level deeper, uh, anything that comes from databases or which is in a CSV format, uh, comma separated uh, variable format or spreadsheets, those are typically what we classify as structured data. Uh, unstructured data, on the other hand, are you know things which are like you know images or videos, which have no inherent structure, data structure. Uh, in between, there are two categories. One is you know I would say data which have partly formatted, um, you know which which can be you know uh, past data and XML. Those kind of uh, data fall under what is called semi-structured data. And there is also a category called quasi-structured data, which are essentially uh, you know, clickstream data on the web, which, uh, you know, really have erratic data forms. So I would say data falls in one of these four categories and not just two categories as we are, you know, told. Uh, it is possible to shift data from one category to another based on uh, various mechanisms and, you know, part of the actual ETL, 
extract, transform, and load. Um, you know, tools in uh, you know in this uh, businesses around probably making data ready to be analyzed. You know, so there is a there is a form or a kind of a structure that is put to data which lies at the you know somewhere close to the bottom to to ensure that you know that data can be analyzed and it is part of the uh, set of features that determine a particular you know um, value of uh, you know a, a subject or what we are trying to kind of gauge in terms of uh, a score this is what I was really talking about in terms of data volumes. I mean, if you really look at the, the chart, I mean, we are moving from the 1990s of, you know, DBMS systems, which, you know, talked in terms of terabytes. Uh, and that's how storage was defined in a data center in the 1990s. To uh, terabyte is something like, which is, you know, uh, 100 gig, uh, 1000 gigabytes. So, so essentially it's, you know, 10 raised to the power 12. And then uh, we move from that scale to, I would say, you know, the 2000s where there was a lot of digital data being generated and primarily on uh, proprietary tools, you had, you know, the Microsoft suite and, uh, you know, Acrobat uh, and so on. So here the data that was stored was in the order of petabytes, which is, you know, 10 raised to the power 15 uh, scale. So, you know, there was a thousand sort of shift as the decade changed and that has moved further to uh, exabytes today. So what is called a quintillion or you know, 10 raised to the power 18 is the exabyte scale today. So if you really look at the amount of data that is being generated every you have 300 billion emails, 25 billion WhatsApp messages and so on and so forth. I mean, these are all leading to around two and a half quintillion or two and a half exabytes. What we believe as well, this will actually go up, you know, by of, you know, uh, uh, 70, where you actually will have 175 zettabytes. Um, uh, of uh, our data. And so what is the next What I would add two points uh, general knowledge of uh, uh, which which is the uh, I just request everyone to go on mute, please, because I think someone is uh, not on mute. Yeah, thank you. So the uh, is is 10 raised to the power 24. And uh, I, I would say the Bronto byte, which is, I would say, the, um, the highest known uh, unit of measure. Lot of no SQL databases running into millions of roles and you know lots of problems. Uh, you're actually seeing uh, you know uh, exabytes of data being stored today in these kind of platforms. Um, so typically Netflix, YouTube, WhatsApp, they all store data in these scales. And what we are basically saying is that you need to move forward, so, you know, probably from this bytes to uh, the system. system. Hmm? system. So, what is the origin of the word data science? I mean, I think there is a lot of, uh, you know, confusion between business analytics, data science, decision plans, and so on and so forth. So one question was, uh, you know, what is data science, right? So it is something that turns data into action. <laughs> for guessing there. So it should be insight, which is really the product of the data. And also, this is something which, you know, gives you a lot of, uh, you know, charts, but it does not translate to telling you what is wrong or telling you what is true, which is, you know, predictable. And we come to the chart and then, you know, really there's no use of that analysis. So, so data science, you actually do this. 
it gives you a pattern. So, you know, what happens often is that we presume that, you know, we just have to do modeling, uh, understanding algorithms is all that it takes, you know, a good knowledge of statistics and algorithms is, is good enough. Frankly, but I would say that, you know, understanding the format of the data and what really are the ways in which that data can be utilized and, you know, how features, the right the features can be extracted. That itself is a, is a big part of this. So, so we should be little that part that, you know, actually assessing the kind of data patterns and understanding. How the format of more chat the other is, uh, you know, once we have the data collected, we formulate a hypothesis. The hypothesis testing, we have done it in all our uh, decision sciences courses. But, you know, if we just use one measure, like uh, a level of significance, a peak value, a you know, an actual, uh, it not be the for us to accept the hypothesis or the hypothesis, uh, we should be able to understand the way we have assessed the confidence of the of the computers we have selected so that we are able to get additional observations and, and you know, reformulate. So it's, it's really a circular, I would say a close control loop where we collect data, we formulate hypothesis, we validate and then we also find out what additional data to collect and so on, so that we are closest to the final stage. As I mentioned, the product is the insight, uh, the insight is the product, I'm sorry, uh, which we do through exploratory analysis. And then, uh, you know, if you look at models, I would say that comes towards the end. Once we are very clear that the data model is right, we select the right model. And it could be, you know, something which is conventional machine learning. It could be uh, deep learning. It could be, you know, some advanced statistics, uh, which we could use to actually translate the data to uh, deeper insights. And uh, what I believe is uh, fundamental knowledge of statistics is clearly very important. And that's what we plan to do in, in, in our courses. And I'll come to that uh, towards the end of the talk. Uh, but uh, apart from the statistics and methodology, and algorithms and uh, understanding of the different models that exist. I think the domain, domain understanding and the setting the industry context is so important. So, so this is where I guess when someone is able to select the industry he wants to specialize in, and he basically does a capstone project related to that industry, actually understands what is going wrong in you know getting a good model out. I think that's where the learning goes closer towards you know being an expert rather than, you know, someone who's just probably a practitioner. This is pretty much what I covered. Now it is really the business context that sets the right problem to be solved. And, you know, based on the limitation of the data that is available, um, building scenarios, because, you know, there's no one right answer, you know, it's everything's a range. Everything is, you know, basically um, uh, a confidence driven uh, output or outcome. Clearly, data science gives you that understanding of stat models and machine learning algorithms. And there's a technology aspect that, you know, what is the right infrastructure? And today, cloud makes our life very easy. So, you know, what is the right kind of resources to be provisioned on the cloud uh, for compute, storage, um, and, uh, you know, really go about uh, choosing the right kind of uh, tools? A lot of people earlier used to use proprietary tools, today open source has, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, equivalent uh, models. So doing data science has become much cheaper. And, and, and that's also one of the reasons why I would say to the previous model where data science is not new, but today the reason why we're able to do data science at scale is because the infrastructure has become cheap. And, you know, you're able to kind of uh, spin up resources very quickly. So if we really look at, you know, is it a science or an art? I would say it is a philosophical question and we can answer it either way. But the business context and the problem formulation is what I define by art. And the infrastructure provisioning and the right model to choose once we have set the right business problem or context is the science. So it's really a mix of both. If we really look at analytics and the way 
is defined. You know, clearly we have to uh, do a lot of data synthesis and visualization, which comes under the realm of uh, descriptive analytics. There is uh, the regression models and you know other models which are uh, you know the deep learning models which are trying to predict future events uh, based on past data. So essentially, that's the predictive part, which tells you what can happen. And prescriptive is really the part which is the realm of optimization using data science. A lot of startups are in this space who are actually telling companies that, OK, if your data was not very good or your data uh, did not predict the correct outcome, forget about that. Look at, based on the kind of challenges you have in the business, what is the right uh, parameters that you know should be set which will give you an optimum outcome so i'll come to that so if you look at descriptive this is really the front end of the work which is around pre-processing cleansing etl so it's all around data standardization transformation and you know making data feasible to be uh, you know modeled right so there's a bit of sampling and uh, reduction and then separation of the training and test set right? when you look at some of the deep learning side of things. If you look at uh, predictive, uh, there are essentially four broad types of uh, models. So when we look at regression, where you're predicting an outcome, uh, you know, whatever form, linear, logistic, uh, it comes under the realm of supervised learning uh, in uh, deep learning uh, parlance. Uh, classification, where based on past data, you're actually choosing the right category. Uh, and you know, classifying it, uh, that's again under the realm of supervised. The clustering part is without looking at past data based on you know, k-means or any other distance algorithm, if you are able to uh, classify uh, you know, data points which belong to the same cluster. So you know, that's, that's unsupervised in that sense. And even things like association uh, rules uh, would fall under uh, unsupervised, mm -hmm. where you're creating the kind of association rules without really uh, trying to train it or look at past data. And if you look at prescriptive models, optimization of all types, I mean, whether it looks, whether you're looking at traveling salesman problem, vehicle routing problem kind of optimization, whether you're looking at uh, packing uh, minimization, bin packing or knapsack packing kind of problems, they all fall under the optimization domain. And then you have simulation and what if, not too much difference between the two, but essentially based on various scenarios, what would be the you know, type of outcome? And that's not been seen in the past. So you know, you're able to, one, understand the limitation of uh, the uh, result set, but also give the, you know, uh, the business a view of what would happen under such kind of scenarios, which could even be black swan scenarios, which haven't been seen, or these are disruptive force majeure kind of scenarios. So this is pretty much the kind of work that would be done in data science models, um, you know, and it's really a, a science and an art. And uh, you know, this is pretty much I was saying, you know, classify the same set of problems into four bins. So you have, you know, the typical prediction models, which could be forecasting models or uh, assessing what is a customer lifetime value. And why this is important is that you want to really understand what is your customer acquisition cost. I mean, does it make sense? the amount of money you'll make from the customer over the lifetime before he churns out, uh, what is the kind of returns you would make on your investment you made in acquiring him by giving him cash discounts or, you know, cash backs or, you know, made him feel nice with a lot of freebies up front, right? So that's part of the cost you incur in acquiring the customer, which is the customer acquisition cost vis-a-vis -vis the customer lifetime value. In the classification, you are trying to use parameters which you think have the strongest correlation with churn. So, you know, this is one very important problem that telecom companies, banks, you know, various, um, you know, big retailers try and understand because, you know, the most important customers should be retained at all costs because to acquire a new customer is probably 5x the cost of, uh, you know, retaining an existing customer. Right? So, uh, so understanding customer churn and, you know, probably even doing a, credit risk without you know going into an actuary model uh, based on past data if your data sets are rich uh, could be something that you could train a model for which could actually help you acquire the right set of customers where the credit risk is acceptable right? 
So a lot of these use cases will come to specific industries in a slide or two. Uh, similarly, when you look at you know uh, things like fingerprint matching or recommender systems, um, these are again things which you're probably using from a past data set where you are uh, trying to, uh, you know, which Aadhaar does with a ten print or you know various uh, uh, you know government agencies to ensure that you know uh, they, they are able to kind of keep records uh, of uh, every citizen and, and especially offenders. Recommender systems, you know, a lot of websites use this for you know uh, trying to uh, do a cross sell. Uh, to to a customer where you know based on similar people of similar demographic or uh, psychographic profiles what are the kind of things they buy okay and uh, the other thing is that based on uh, things like you know uh, market basket analysis and things which we'll also come to uh, how do you ensure that you have made the person buy all the items and he's not forgotten something which he orders as a separate order and then you incur twice the delivery cost for being able to supply because you'll be supplying in the same time window or same time commitment. So if you are able to ensure that the customer buys all the items in one shot, you have ensured that you know, you're not duplicating your transportation cost and you're keeping the customer happy in terms of how fast he gets what he wants. And optimization, I covered it in the previous slide about you know, vehicle routing problems or bin backing problems. These are very real problems that supply chain within retail FMCG, uh, web e-commerce kind of companies are trying to solve because logistics cost is you know between five to ten percent of their costs, and this is not considering uh, return cost, right? So that would add you know another three four percent, uh, and this doesn't take into account quality check and you know all kinds of other costs that get added on when a, a, a return route comes in. Uh, as part of e-commerce, so all these companies are trying to find out ways in which they can optimize, um, you know, their uh, transport and logistics costs. So these are some of the options in terms of, you know, what are the problems uh, various industries are trying to solve. I've considered, um, you know, six industries, but if you really look at manufacturing, for instance, you know, these these are not typically been people who have done a lot of analytics on their ERP again. Juries out, I would say more companies in India. So they can actually do a lot in terms of their supply chain analytics and you know ways in which they can do revenue assurance management and warranty analytics based on you know the data they already have. Unfortunately, a lot of that data is not in digital form and therefore cannot very easily be uh, analyzed uh, from a data science perspective. Uh, but a lot of companies are in the stage of digitizing their data and trying to do some of this analytics. And if you look at the source of data that they have, the internal data is, is, is really the most important which they need to digitize. And a lot of the, I would say, profitability could be determined by a company which is more advanced, in, let's say warranty analytics or after sales service, because anyway, companies are charging 3x the price vis-a-vis -vis the OEM prices. So if they are able to plan this better where they minimize warranty and maximize after sales, uh, not in terms of denying warranty, but in terms of actually analyzing what are the kind of items that are going wrong, maybe uh, working with their vendors to ensure that the kind of, uh, you know, the QA, QE, uh, which is part of every company's, uh, uh, you know, uh, way in which they try and minimize the, the, the cost of replacement, especially warranty. Uh, can be minimized. Uh, similarly, you know, there's ways in which they can predict commodity prices and, you know, have conversations where they do reverse auctions and they are able to get extract the best prices. You know, sometimes what happens is even long term contracts can work uh, adversely, especially with commodities where, you know, there have been more down cycles than up cycles. And if they are able to understand that, OK, at some point of time, spot prices may actually work better than long term contracts. Uh, you know, companies could actually use uh, such um, flexible contracts to be able to minimize their raw material costs or, you know, uh, uh, vendor costs. Similarly, I think if you look at retail, retail and banking have very similar problems in terms of, you know, promotions and forecasting demand. Right? So if they are able to solve these problems about, you know, what is the right promotion strategy in terms of reach? what is the kind of right medium 
uh, what is the way of uh, segmentation of one where you can target people on the medium they're using for let's say seeing uh, promotions of uh, you know the the product that the retailer is selling or you know the product the bank is selling then they are able to get that much more uh, you know um, you know uh, a, a sort of impact of those promotions and uh, you know it kind of is not cpm but it's more cpc that you know you get a click rather than you know an impression right? similarly market basket if it's very similar to the previous problem we covered that if you know uh, companies are able to understand what products sell together. They can one do a cross sell and recommendation, but they can also probably uh, understand that they can put out a message saying, you know, are you sure that you're done? So if you're buying eggs and milk together and you've only ordered eggs, you know, please order the milk because you know you order that in tandem, right? And you've forgotten to order the milk. So, so these are things like Big Basket is doing actually. They are recommending uh, to their customers that are you sure before checkout. That you have ordered the milk, and then once you've ordered the milk, okay, I'll supply both together, and I will ensure that I'm optimized in terms of the cost and, you know, uh, the customer service. So, so those are kind of things that are uh, are problems that are being solved in real time by a lot of companies internally. They're also taking the help of startups to kind of do that kind of, uh, uh, you know, optimization, planning, and forecasting. And uh, obviously, you know the. Uh, the data is, is is the most important part. So, so I think uh, no points for that. But I think uh, companies are realizing that you know really data is the new one. Healthcare, of course, a lot of use cases, uh, which uh, today is a bit of a closed system in India, but a lot of work being done in the U.S. and some other markets like uh, you know Middle East and so on. Banking and finance, I would say, similar use case to retail. Uh, you look at even service industry. A lot of people are actually trying to understand, you know, really how do they optimize their use of manpower. Earlier, with a cost plus model, uh, companies did not really care. Today, with a market determined rate and you know tremendous competition, and a lot of commoditization of services, right? A lot of the services have become very commoditized uh, in IT services, um, uh, in the BPO industry, in process services, and so on. You know, how do you ensure that you're able to price it right at a point which is attractive to the customer and you're able to also, you know, uh, manage your costs, right? So those kind of analysis, um, you know, is, is something that companies are trying to do with uh, better uh, analysis of their past data. Okay, so market basket analysis, I just wanted to show you that, you know, these are things which, you know, typically get done with few lines of code and this is an R where actually, you know, the visualization of the data is where, you know, for instance, you're seeing bottled water and brown bread on the left, uh, you know, uh, corner of the screen is going together. So you actually know that these are the high profile kind of customers you have, you know, they, they like brown bread, they don't want to go for white bread and, you know, bottled water and so on. Uh, you could be down at the, you know, bottom of the slide and look at white bread and fruit, vegetable juice. These are more value customers, right, who really, you know, want to be very value conscious and they, they order these two items in tandem. You could look at something like sugar and curd on the right side of the screen and, you know, clearly a lot of people, um, you know, uh, order these together. So, so this is broadly what comes out from, you know, specifically the internal data of a retailer. And, and this is where it makes so much sense to have a good data science team, which is within your organization is working and look at companies like Walmart, Target, Everyone have, you know, very strong data science teams, which are internal because they don't want the data to go out. They want the internal team to use the latest models and use the, you know, the best uh, data, right? Or, or, you know, teams that can actually do this with higher granularity. And we all know the, uh, the target case study of, uh, you know, pregnant girl and so on. Right? So, so there is a lot of value in this data. And if I were to just conclude, there is, you know, a few steps which typically get done. And um, essentially, the, the, the domain understanding and the problem context setting is the most important step. And that's where someone who comes at it with an industry understanding and has done projects in that industry add value. Uh, or they can add immediate value, I would say. And then you go about collecting the right features and the right set of data and you try and you know uh, you know get the data in a format that can be you know uh, uh, used for the models. Uh, 
uh, you do pre-processing of the data, uh, and then finally the model building. And and you know everyone will tell you that it's 80-20, 80% goes in the first three steps, and model building probably is is 20%. But I would say model building to interpretation and going back and getting the right additional data and you know working in tandem that's pretty much the life cycle of of, of this kind of work and it's it's very exciting and it it really requires a bit of diligence where you get the uh, actual knowledge with statistics and math and you get the domain and industry context and then you could be an extremely valuable resource right so so these are really the steps I would say that you know where you need to be playing a role in each of these steps. You 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 can't be stuck in one area. And if you look at people in terms of what they do based on the number of years of experience, uh, zero to four years. I mean, this is again just I mean, don't take it at uh, something which is very literally true. I mean, there could be people who are very smart who could you know very quickly jump to the second uh, grid from the first. So the first. Younger people do a lot of the pre-processing work, the first three steps. Uh, they obviously become experts in R and Python and other languages. Um, they do a lot of uh, modeling, but you know that could be one line of code uh, if you know the right model to select. And then visualization is very important because they have to present it in the form their managers understand, especially from the business side. And uh, obviously, they have to have a lot of nitty-gritty knowledge. Um, the four to eight year people do a lot of manpower management and sometimes that's the challenge. Uh, we see that people move away from, you know, really hands-on work to managing teams. Uh, but that's really up to you. I mean, there, there is nothing stopping someone who is in this age bracket to get more and more deeper into the latest uh, algorithms that are coming out to take part in Kaggle competitions and, and keep themselves abreast with the latest technologies, right? And when you look at uh, the, the people with eight to twelve years experience, these are people who are really, you know, managing clients, right? So, so they are, have a project delivery responsibility. They're clearly responsible for whatever they delegate. But the challenge is that if you become very people dependent and there's a high churn, uh, you know, the project could be at risk, right? So, the more hands-on that people in uh, quadrant two and three are, uh, and and if they have started grounds up uh, with, you know, either training or they have come up as a data scientist or a data engineer, uh, the better it is. And, and, and then, you know, really the last is uh, a, a management role. Uh, but, you know, uh, design thinking, the, the, the customer transformation journey, those are things that clearly are important. And, you know, the exposure to that for even the people who are younger is something that we try and do in our course and, and we'll come to that. So that's pretty much what I had. I will just uh, spend 10 minutes on, uh, you know, just, I would say, uh, what the program is about, because I'm sure all of you would want to know a bit about uh, the program. Uh, so pardon me for that. This is a bit of, uh, you know, I would say talking about uh, the, uh, the, you know, the enviable program we have here. I think it's a fantastic program. So IFM has a 25 years track record. We have been uh, you know, disrupting our curriculum without really having people tell us to change our curriculum, right? So if you really look at the way in which IFM has been uh, devising, you know, uh, industry uh, experience programs, the kind of industry practitioners that come here and teach, the kind of healthy mix of academics and industry practice, and the, of course, the accreditations, uh, IFM is, is, is in a league of its own. If you uh, look at, you know, its mission, clearly, we want to be in touch with the times, right? So if today people are trying to hire T-shaped professionals, you want to be, high, you know, trying to create those kind of professionals. So you want to have people who are T-shaped, they are deep in some area, may not be deep in a lot of areas. You have good faculty, you have, you know, clearly a lot of accreditations like AACSB, we are the sixth college to get AACSB certification, probably there are 15 here, uh, probably 5% of the B schools globally have an AACSB. So, so clearly we are in a, you know, a, a, a very hallowed uh, league of our own. And then uh, this is really the T-shape. So what does it mean? It means that, you know, you're not only teaching core courses on management, but you're actually doing labs. You are, you know, uh, 
creating ways in which you enhance your personality through grooming and through sports or you know ways in which uh, things that would interest you like yoga you would have social immersion programs where you're doing a social cause you have things like research incubation where you're doing research projects um, you know these are things which you know probably a lot of business schools don't do and this is where our students really stand out because they've got exposure to so many different areas right and then you look at the major and the super specializations uh, we call it super specialization what it means is that you know like i talked about domain and industry skills these are things which you know probably get you to get that set apart from being just someone who understands r or python well or you know who can code without really you know uh, needing any and any you know uh, i would say be uh, deep debrief and so on and so forth right so you're just not someone who is very good at coding but you're someone who really understands domain and the industry context if you look at insofi uh, of course they are sort of players who have been there in the last decade uh, in data science they focus only on data science i mean that that's a fantastic place to be in because uh, you know uh, there's there's a lot of focus so they are the key part of this program uh, they have 6000 plus students who have come out in the last decade they have been in business uh, they run corporate training programs their pgp uh, course is highly employable they have almost 100% placement for you know all the students that come out of their intense programs they're you know uh, probably uh, the third or second ranked institute now uh, as an analytics teaching institute on their way to the top and uh, they teach uh, people with all levels of experience right so it could be people who are fresh out of college it could be people with you know 20 years who want to become data scientists because they've heard this is the new thing you know or this is the way to get into a product company from a service company right and uh, they have you know 15 full time and eight adjunct faculty and i'll come to the profile in a slide or two i mean these are absolute top class faculty i think this is something which is very important to consider that you know who are the people teaching you and what is their industry experience and you know how much depth do they have i think that's that's really something that you know probably you should be very bothered about um they have data scientists who will actually handle handhold you through the actual programs and actual course and like i said you know these are people who are practicing academicians they don't focus so much of producing papers as they focus of creating uh, you know current industry solutions to a problem right so that's where the value gets built when you're working with these kind of people uh, to to create uh, you know current industry use cases and you have your own capstone project which you have to do from end so it's not that you know you are part of a team and someone does the project and you just probably bask in the glory or you probably do the writing and the business part of things you have to do your project end to end Uh, these are some of the faculty. Dr. Uh, Dakshina Murthy, the second from right, is the founder of uh, Insofi. He also teaches, so that shows you the focus. Uh, Dr. Shridhar Papu, uh, fourth, he's he's the co-founder. So uh, they had a vision that they would hire only the best PhDs in their institute. And if you really look at the profile of all the professors here, I mean, they are all PhDs from the best institutes in the US and and ISC Bangalore. If you look at some of the domain, you have deep learning, blockchain, NLP, big data, structured data. So all kinds of specialists, and you know, some of them run their own startups. For instance, uh, Rafael runs his own blockchain startup. He's extremely familiar with you know what is the real blockchain problems being tackled by the industry here. If you look at some of the other people, they come from industry. Rohit uh, comes from IBM. Uh, you know, twenty-five years experience. IBM research so they all have huge amount of experience right uh, if you look at you know um, anand jayaraman he comes from you know wall street where he actually ran you know uh, these kind of market uh, financial an analytics models and data science for you know uh, wall street banks uh, if you look at dr sunkar he's actually dr venkatesh is the dean of this program a very important person so he used to be in vodafone he's an expert in iot and so what you find is that people who are there in senior leadership roles are also hands on faculty right so they understand exactly you know how to maintain quality in teaching and how to hire the best and and retain the best right so if you 
just probably take one more slide and you know look at the accreditations. I mean, I talked about WACSB. If you look at SACS, AICT, you know all the kind of certifications uh, that are required for an MBA program or for uh, uh, you know management and uh, masters level. Um, you know, IFM pretty much has all of that. Uh, Insofi has had huge amount of experience in data science, and they've worked with uh, you know three or four foreign institutes. Um, uh, like Carnegie Mellon and Dr. Murthy is from Carnegie Mellon himself and uh, you know Case Western and so on where they are trying to bring in that you know best practice into the data science and you know it's like really getting the best of both worlds right um, you, you're getting you know US level education at Indian fees if I could call it that right um, and, and you know the cost of the course is around just just a share under 10 lakhs uh, for a you know 18 month program which should be you know really telling you where this course is really featuring vis-a-vis -vis any comparable course uh, in, in US or any other you know market uh, and and finally if you really look at the companies that are hiring and this is really a small subset of companies I mean you look at you know the flip cards targets you know people who are hiring people with varied experience and uh, you know, and, and these are all the short term programs. So if you actually look at the management and MBA kind of specialization, which the PGDM gives you, it would give you that much more legs up into higher leadership or management roles. And you could, you know, be an individual contributor and be as hands on as you want. Or you could choose to be running a team of data scientists who actually run this kind of program. So what I'll do is I'll end there because I think, you know, pretty much I've covered what I had. Uh, leave this slide on and and you know probably wait for questions from your side i think we have uh, 15 minutes more so you know probably you could take as many questions that could be covered uh, in these 15 minutes so pradeep uh, if you can just you know invite the questions please Just give me one minute, please. I think, uh, not sure how the queue is being managed for uh, the questions. Very happy to take the questions once the queue is established. Yeah, the questions. Is there a way in which we can? Want to see this? Yeah, I just wanted to see the queue of questions. So let me do all. Yeah. And meet. Yes, sir. Yeah, please go ahead. You just give it a minute or two. If there's any specific questions you have, I'll be happy to answer. So while we wait for the questions, let me just give a couple of more data points related to the program. Uh, the program is open right now. This is a PGDM and data science. Uh, the actual course is supposed to start on the 17th of February. So uh, the eligibility is that, you know, someone who has a valid NMAT score, 
Narsi Manji and uh, or has to give a, a separate in Sophie online test score. Uh, I think there's a cutoff of maybe 60% for that course. And then, uh, you know, you basically pay the fees and get enrolled. So this is a continuing sort of cycle where whoever sort of signs up on the site can register for the course. They can, um, uh, you know, uh, pay the, uh, you know, let's say the registration, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the exam fee. Uh, which is around i think 3000 rupees and then you sort of uh, give the test mm -hmm. and then based on the scores uh, you know you you get inducted mm -hmm. in the program and we sort of try and fill this up we are trying to target maybe a batch of 60 students in bangalore and uh, another 60 students in hyderabad so both these uh, will be the two cohorts which will be running exactly the same cycle where they will be undergoing you know uh, courses on data science and then uh, coming and uh, doing courses on business, uh, which is the MBA courses, and then uh, going into the research projects, and then finally ending with the uh, internship. And then, you know, probably the placement process where they will then get placed into, uh, into companies. So, so that's pretty much the way the broad calendar works. In terms of the kind of students that we are really seeking is we are really seeking students who are, I would say, very keen or eager to learn about data science. You know, it's really not that you're looking at someone who is a, you know, level two math uh, algorithm sort of person or someone who necessarily comes from a tech background. These are people who are essentially keen to understand data science. Maybe they come from the business side, but they realize that, okay, Maybe a planning or a strategy role would be best supplemented with, you know, deeper understanding of the analytics. So for various reasons, people want to get the T-shaped skills. And uh, we would encourage, you know, such uh, students who are really motivated to learn rather than really coming from a engineering or a math background to uh, has to be eligible here. As we said, the um, test itself is like a CAT test. It's, you know, has some amount of understanding of statistics, some understanding of English language. These are essentially people who can probably sit for NMAT or CAT today, but they will actually have to have a slightly deep understanding of uh, some of the uh, base statistics theory. I mean, they can't be someone who probably has not done maths in a, uh, you know, after class 10 or so. Uh, of course, if the person is inherently good in, in the subject, uh, I, I don't think that's a prerequisite that we will put. I mean, the score is the most important that you need to have a score of 60 plus in the online test, or you have a valid NMAT score where we'll have a cutoff of, I think, 80 percentile and, uh, and, and then, you know, um, move forward to uh, checking your eligibility very quickly. And, uh, and and then on board. I think the lines are unmuted. So if there is any specific um, query you have, you can just probably you know shout it out, and I'll I'll be able to address them. Sorry, I'm not able to see my screen. I'm not sure whether there's any. Uh. Okay, so it's good. I mean, I think probably um, it, it means I've been very clear <laughs> in terms of, uh, you know, what um, really what, uh, uh, primer on data science and, and the program. 
uh, we have a website which has been updated and you know all the latest collateral is there so if you have any queries which is probably not on the website uh, you can definitely give us a call and uh, you know the contact details of the person who's handling this uh, will also be there and um, and you can find out probably how we rank vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other courses there uh, my understanding is this is the first pgdm in data science course in india which is uh, face to face it's a contact program so clearly you know in india we don't value online courses as much as we do offline courses so so this is definitely a offline pgdm in data science it gives you the same certificate that an mba or a pgdm from our institute gets uh, of course the additional thing is that this is done in partnership with insofi there could be options later on where if you choose a super specialization where you would want to get a exposure to a global situation where the super specialization could be with one of our partner institutes globally that could also be a flexibility that could be accorded later on where you do the super specialization with this um, institute overseas and you probably get a immersion in 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 uh, in, in that um, country uh, and you know solve some of the problems there but i would say you know the the exciting thing is india is at that juncture where there is so much of um still i would say inertia related to data science uh you know data is something which is um, uh you know most of the architects only talk of data and lack of data so if you are at this phase it's a very exciting phase where you are getting on the boat probably at the right time and and therefore i think probably you know it would be good okay i think i have one question from abhishek which says if anyone wants to start learning about data science like basics to see what it is about what would you suggest to learn and brush up upon i think abhishek uh, you know there is enough books on data science you know so you can pick up anything i mean there's a lot of even online courses that you can pick up uh if you see edx and coursera and all that so these are all online courses right which will give you a background of data science either using r using python they'll give you a context of what is really data science right so you can find out you know even going to that level of online learning what the offline model is is one apart from you know the certification of being an mba in data science is actually giving you people who have 20 plus years experience in the industry working on current problems in the industry so i would say don't look at data science as something that like a discipline just to be learned for like a practice practitioner but it is something where like i said you know the problem formulation and domain and industry context is not there i mean you will be like a, a, a more highly paid it service person you know i mean you can call it a product engineer you can be working for flipkart but the role will be very limited so i would say that you know it's not really about data science but it is really what you would be at the end of the course where you get this kind of teaching and mentoring from experienced faculty who you should be convinced are best in class and that you're getting in india at india prices should be the driver of a decision related to this course but yes i mean there's plenty of material available on data science i'm sure you know you could easily google and get uh, you know the, the most popular courses and, and you could you know probably take some of these you know learn it for a week or two and really find out whether this is of interest to you or this is something that you probably may not enjoy too much because when you're making a career shift you have to be very clear that this is something you can do for the next 20 30 years and and you know this is something that is not going away you know as more and more automation comes in place and more and more you know analytics comes in place across marketing finance supply chain and you know uh, various other areas you know the common uh, discipline of analytics will be something that these jobs as they say you know are not going away in a hurry but some of the other jobs where you know you're relying on someone else to do the analytics for you may not remain very long or it may you know be with very few senior people and so the teams who are not you know kind of in this kind of 
advanced level work may may be you know not having too much of a runway so hope that addresses your query um, on that right any other questions i think we have 3 uh, 4 minutes more but i'm i'm happy to stay on to address any query depending on you know the volumes i found of course you would have heard about the college and you know they really running um, uh, uh, pgdm today and the specializations are finance marketing and uh, analytics the analytics that is taught here is more i would say leading to the functions like you know finance and marketing analytics and it's at a business analytics level um but what this data science program does is i would say business analytics plus plus where it's teaching you a lot about using uh, you know r python coding being a person who can provision the infrastructure you can work on an industry problem where you know a, a typical uh, mba course may not give you that much of uh, time or focus to be able to do that so that's why we thought you know that a separate program in data science would really stand out for people who really saw data science as the future and i definitely see it as the future and um, and and that's why we tied up with a specialist uh, you know partner like in sofi because we wanted to have the best uh, faculty teaching on this course and they will continue to do that so all courses going forward the business courses will really come out of ifm and the data analytics uh, i'm sorry the data science courses will come out of uh, in sofi and i've shown you some of the profiles of the professors and and uh, you know i would say the research scientists this is a full time uh, course which is residential uh people can actually come and you know probably stay here in a hostel uh, they might need to do a leave of absence from their employers if they actually see this as something that they would like to pursue uh, of course there could be some flexibility in the initial couple of months where you know uh, if someone is needing time to hand over projects or get that uh, sabbatical or you know planning to leave uh, and and take up this course full time and then go on to a different kind of employer Uh, those are sort of things that could be taken care of so i don't think the start of the program would be driving the fact that you know someone who is um, a working professional today has uh, you know uh, two less time to decide so the first batch starts february uh, but of course you know we this program will keep running so we will probably have uh, the next batch coming on maybe middle of the year or you know same time uh, the following year and uh, you know pretty much uh, the curriculum is all pretty much set and and, and fine tuned uh, the other good thing that uh, ifm and uh, you know um, insofi have done is that they have tailored the business courses to be able to teach the kind of domain and industry context kind of factors so it all becomes a closed loop even between uh, the business courses and the data science courses so one question i think from vanshika is what courses should the current pgdm analytics major students take if you are una unable to enroll in the data science program i think vanshika is a student of mine so <laughs> so i think um, see the issue really is that you know the data science program is completely different so vanshika i think uh, you know the analytics courses are giving you a business analytics view which makes you able to define it from a functional context and really the onus is on the existing students to be able to uh, you know leverage what they can from the courses here itself so the approach has to be exactly the same uh, what you get access to in terms of uh, you know the people who are not able to enroll in this program is also probably access to the faculty and you know other people who are teaching because the insofi staff will be co-located here so uh, so i think really there is nothing constraining the current pgdm students from being able to benefit from both programs uh, equally but just remember that data science program is is very different from the current business analytics because it teaches you a lot of um, 
skills in uh, you know uh, our python coding and uh, you know defining problems and maybe doing much deeper research which probably the current course or a general mba program will not have the bandwidth for so that's pretty much what i had on this so i think we are over time but uh, i think maybe if there is one or two more questions i could probably address that or if you feel that you know pretty much this gave you an idea of um what we plan to do you know we can just probably log off and and get some time on hand also but uh, i i would really appreciate I, i really appreciate you know uh the audience for being patient and hearing me through uh, i think uh, uh probably the places where uh, you know it was where i may not have been able to do justice to cover topic in sufficient depth but this was really a overview of the overall area of data science and and some uh, more idea about the course uh, happy to connect i mean you can call me also direct uh, on on my phone or you can speak to someone from the program office uh, if you need to understand anything more about the program so if there's no further questions i would like to uh, you know probably call it a day and uh, you know and and say goodbye <laughs>